and Sanjo Nigata Prefecture, an unsuspecting young girl's life would soon take an airy twist, plunging her into a harrowing ordeal that defied imagination. Kidnapped from the very streets she once roamed, she would soon become entangled in a story of unimaginable hardship, all while navigating the chilling presence of her captor. This is the extraordinary story and haunting tale of Fusako Sano. On November 13th, 1990, at around 5 p.m., nine-year-old Fusako Sano was walking home after watching a baseball game at her school, but the young girl was unaware that she was being followed. Suddenly, she noticed a car screech to a stop behind her. A man got out of the car, brandishing a knife, and charged at her. He told her not to scream or move, and out of fear, she did exactly what she was told, as a stranger grabbed her and threw her into the trunk of his car. And with that, she wouldn't be seen again for another nine years. Her captor was 28-year-old Nobuyoki Sato. Sato was unemployed, lived with his mother, and had been displaying signs of mental illness for a long time. In 1989, whatever dark desires he had harbored in his mind came to the surface. In June of that year, he waited outside of elementary school until a group of young girls came outside. He began to follow them and noticed as one of them strayed towards a vacant lot. He saw it as the opportunity and decided to act, swiftly dragging the girl into the lot and attempting to sexually assault her. But he was being watched by another young girl who ran to a group of other older students and told them what had happened. A school office worker was called and hurried to the scene. The office worker managed to prevent Sato from harming the girl and the police were called. Sato was arrested on charges of attempted assault. And in September, a short while after his father passed away, Sato was given a one-year suspended sentence by the courts. They determined he was a low risk and unlikely to offend again, but they were wrong. It is unknown if the act was planned or not, but on the 13th of November in 1990, for whatever reason, he took his mother's car and went for a drive. He spotted young Fusako Sano walking home and became intrigued. He followed behind her and made the split decision to take the action and kidnap her. After the girl was thrown into the trunk, he drove for several miles, eventually stopping on the side of the road. He jumped out, opened the trunk, and bound the girl's hands together as well as blindfolded her. From there, he drove to his house and it sounded like he was planning to do something. When he arrived, he led Fusako through the entire back entrance of the additional part of the house and locked her in the upstairs room. He then went back down and entered through the front part of the house as to not arouse any suspicion. Back upstairs with Fusako, he took off her blindfold and told her she would never leave that room. He threatened to harm her if she dared to disobey him and that he would bury her or dump her body into the ocean. And that, obviously, terrified the young girl and she ended up doing as she was told. That evening, Fusako's mother reported her missing. A search party of 200 people was formed and an extensive search took place. Police helicopters were even utilized to help look for the girl, but unfortunately, they found no trace of her. During Fusako's confinement, Sada would often threaten her, flinging a knife around and causing small lacerations on her skin. Initially, he would tightly bind her body whenever he went to bed or left the room. He kept her blindfold most of the time so she would never learn the layout of the house if he left. After a year or two in captivity, Sato became more violent. He began using a stun gun on her and threatened to stab her if she screamed. He would also reenact professional wrestling movies he'd seen on television, twisting and turning her young body into painful positions. Sato would often strike Fusako, at first lightly, but gradually he began to beat her with more and more ferocity once temporarily blinding her after hitting her in the eye. She began to disassociate to cope with her trauma and pain, and it seemed like no help was coming and she would just have to accept her fate. Sato brought her men's clothes and fed her three times a day, but soon he became concerned that she was developing diabetes after seeing a bruise on her leg, which was likely caused by him. So with that, he decided to reduce her meals to one a day. Fusako dropped a significant amount of weight, becoming painfully thin and weak. Sato would cut Fusako's hair and allow her to bathe now and then, but always under supervision. She was also allowed to listen to the radio and occasionally was given permission to watch TV. She would pass the time by talking with Sato about topics that interested him, like cars and horses. Sato would later describe her as his friend and was convinced he had provided her with everything she needed to develop. He described her as an irreplaceable partner that he could never let go of. It's bizarre that this man considered a little girl to be his partner and never once considered the harm that he was doing. In his mind, he had provided a perfectly adequate environment for her to grow up in. This was primarily because she was too emaciated and further exacerbated by the fact that she had lost the will to fight back. By January in 1996, Sato's violent behavior began to extend towards his mother. 
She consulted a mental health facility, but no further action was ever taken. Sato would become physically aggressive whenever his mother asked questions or tried to set foot upstairs. Out of fear, she remained on the first floor and never dared to go up there. By 1999, Sato's violence escalated as he began to use the stun gun on his mother. He also began to beat his mother and tie her up. On January 12th of 2000, his mother called a mental health facility for help, but she was ignored. She called again on January 19th, and this time they decided to send officials over to aid her on the 28th. When officials arrived, they charged up to the second floor to Sato's room. They informed him that he would be taken in for an evaluation, but Sato did not take kindly to this and had a violent outburst. Burst. The police were eventually called to the scene to help control the situation. As officials and officers stood in Sato's room, they noticed a lump moving under the blanket on his floor. Curious, they lifted up the blanket and saw Fusako curled up staring at them. When they asked who she was, she simply told them she needed to collect her thoughts. Sato's mother was brought into the room and questioned, but she said she'd never seen her before. The officials told Fusako that Sato was going away and asked if she had a place to stay. Meekly, Fusako would turn to Sato's mother and asked if she could stay there. It's possible that she'd been conditioned for so long by Sato that she thought the room was a place of safety. Fusako was unable to answer questions about her family or where she lived before. Seeing her emaciated state and witnessing her strange behavior, she was transported by officers to the nearest hospital for examination. Sato, on the other hand, was taken to a psychiatric clinic, and his hold over Fusako was finally over. At the hospital, Fusaka was found to be in a relatively healthy condition, although she was severely underweight, dehydrated, had jaundice, and her leg muscles had atrophied, but other than that, she was good. While she was there, she told authorities that she had been abducted and held in captivity. It was noted that she was childlike in her answers, and although she was now 19, it seemed that she had retained the manner of being a 9-year-old girl. It would turn out that due to a lack of socialization and exposure to the outside world, Fusako never fully developed mentally, and she was also suffered with severe PTSD. With that though, just hours after she was found, she was reunited with her family. Sato, who was 37 at that point, was hospitalized and declared mentally unstable. After a month of treatment, he was investigated by police and arrested on February 11th of 2000. When the case went public, his mother was heavily criticized. Many wondered how she didn't know about Fusako's existence, however, Fusako herself confirmed that Sato's mother had never seen her. But police were unconvinced as she had bought feminine hygiene products over the years. Whether these were for her or for Fusako remains unknown, and none of Sato's mother's fingerprints were ever found on the second floor. The police were also heavily criticized, and the public wondered why Sato was allowed to go free after his first offense, or why he wasn't considered a suspect when the abduction occurred. It was eventually revealed that Sato's records were removed from the criminal database for reasons unknown. On May 23rd of 2000, Sato's trial began. He claimed insanity and an evaluation took place, but found him fit to stand trial. Eventually, Sato admitted his guilt. The sentence for abduction at that point was typically 10 years in prison, but the prosecution felt this was too short. To lengthen his sentence, they added additional charges such as a shoplifting offense that Sato had committed earlier in his life. Sato was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in prison. He appealed on January 24th of 2002, and the trial went to high court. It was decided that his sentence would be reduced to 11 years and that his previous ruling was done incorrectly as he should have been charged with individual crimes instead of several all at once. But this was also overturned, and the sentence was reinstated back to 14 years. On April 15, Sato was released from prison in Chiba. He stayed in Chiba for the remainder of his life and lived on welfare. He was found dead in 2017, causes of which still remain unknown. As for Fusako, she gradually grew to find peace. She underwent extensive counseling and slowly began to assimilate back into society. But her life took another tragic turn when her father drowned in front of her a few years after her rescue. After dealing with her loss, she moved to the countryside to work on her family's rice paddy. Today, Fusako Sano is an inspiring symbol of hope and resilience. Her story serves as a reminder of the abominable human spirit, the power of family bonds, and the importance of perseverance in the face of adversity. Fusako Sano's journey from the depths of despair to the light of recovery is a testament to the power of hope and the human capacity to endure, heal, and thrive. However, lingering questions do remain, so what do you think? Could additional measures have been taken to avert this tragedy? Does the responsibility ultimately rest with the law enforcement or with Sato's mother? I want to know what y'all think, so definitely let me know in the comments below. And we'll be back soon with another store IRL. But until then, stay curious about the stories in the world around you.